Okay, the title of uh, the presentation paper is Helping Hybrid Children Shine. What the Global Church Can Do. And Dr. Miriam Edney is a professor, anthropologist, missiologist, and journalist at Seattle Pacific University. Among her books are Kingdom Without Borders, The Untold Story of Global Christianity, Daughters of Islam, Building Bridges and with Muslim Women, God's Foreign Policy, Practical Ways to Help the World's Poor and Wealth Women and God. Miriam has been president of the American Society of Missiology, recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from Christians for Biblical Equality, board member for Christianity Today, and staff member and publication secretary for the Philippine InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Please welcome Miriam Adeni. Good morning. I hope it is still morning, yes. Hybrid children come from expatriate families, migrant families, refugee families, immigrant families, and unaccompanied children who cross borders. I am exploring three questions. What children think about culture and identity? What parents can do to make the journey one where they flourish, and what the global church can do. I will read selectively from this paper. What children think about culture and identity. Research indicates both benefits and detriments when children are raised by nationally. So many such children demonstrate an excellent educational grounding, broadly cosmopolitan worldview, creative problem solving, and confident interaction with all kinds of people. At the same time, it is not uncommon for bicultural children to exhibit depression, reduced affect, and emphasis on adapting rather than belonging, and sometimes increased prejudice. Similarly, returning to the home country may temporarily reduce a child's sense of well-being and induce stress and grief over the loss of treasured people and spaces, places, ignorance of customary practices and terms, and confusion over worldview and identity. That's when they return home. There's a compilation of essays written by anthropologists entitled Children in the Field, written by anthropologists who took their children with them to the field. Uh, these scholars struggle with on one hand, uh, the desire to help their children adapt to the culture where they go, and on the other hand, to keep their children safe. Uh, and then I have an example of uh, three children who went with their parents to a slum in Brazil and um, faced these issues in various ways. Uh, but going to the uh, bottom, I need to find the, your, your section here, if I can, sorry. Going to uh, the next page, page uh, 23, uh, top of the page. Awkward, perplexing, sometimes unanswerable questions will arise when children live in two cultures. While adults can understand the difference between deep and surface adaptation and can behave in a appropriately in different cultures within that framework, children cannot switch standards so easily. They are struggling with an emerging sense of self. They live in the present. Reality is what surrounds them now. They cannot stand outside and suspend judgment. Christian parents will, I hope, be inclined to bond with local people because God loves all people. Nevertheless, perplexing cultural differences will arise. What is the right way to plan our time, to spend money and account for it, to exercise authority, to express initiative, 
to settle quarrels. What is proper etiquette? Or, or good sanitation? Or material standard of living? What are the important social relationships? Parents and children will be faced with these dilemmas when they move to a new land. Beyond culture differences, power differences also may impact us. In the Arabian Gulf, for example, local citizens often look down on laborers from poorer countries. Migrants have fewer rights and opportunities. They cannot retire in the countries where they work and their children have no future there. Often the children will not be allowed into local schools. When power inequalities like these seem overwhelming, parents may need to place their family story in the long tradition of the suffering servant and his followers described in Hebrews 11 with the sure knowledge that God, in God's time, we shall overcome. What then can parents do? Here are some recommendations for life on the road. And I have these in six uh, sections. First, the theology of culture, then issues of schooling, then issues of social media, then uh, how does a family have fun, and then uh, what is the role of other adults in raising children overseas? Theology of culture which as an anthropologist, of course, I think is basic and foundational to everything. Uh, last sentence in the first paragraph uh, under that title. Parents must teach a simple theology of culture as a framework for interacting with the questions that I just read to you. We can teach that all people are created by God and all people are sinners. Cultures reflect this tension because cultures are made by people over time. Therefore, all cultures include patterns of wisdom and beauty and truth, and at the same time, all cultures will contain patterns of exploitation. Different cultures may be strong and weak in different areas. Some cultures may be more efficient. In others, people may be more generous. Some may be more orderly. Others may be more vivacious. Some cultures have lower death rates. Without creating overall stereotypes, such variables can be discussed with children. We love the country where we were born because it is the land of our forefathers and foremothers. We love the new land because it is the home of friends with whom we are passing irreplaceable years. Certainly, God loves both cultures. Sometimes we will adapt our behavior out of courtesy because the issue at hand is simply one of politeness. At other times, the issue is one of conviction, and we must stand firm. We can make those distinctions for our children, that is, explain it to them. In the best situations, we consult local Christians to see how they interpret what seem to us to be matters of conviction. Then we may learn new facts that will cause us to alter our views. It is important not to lose our roots, nor to diminish the value of others' roots. In the book, Being Latino in Christ, Orlando Crespo tells about his friend Daniel. During college, Daniel did everything within his power to stay far away from his family. He did not want to deal with his Dominican father because deep down he knew that he would have to face the good and the bad of his own culture and identity. Only after Daniel moved out of New York City and became a pastor did he realize how important it was to come to terms with his Latino experience and his family of origin. Several years later, he moved back to New York City and deliberately chose a pastoral position near where his relatives live. He did this in order to further explore his identity as a Dominican man. Crespo says, this has been a valuable and important part of Daniel's journey toward self-understanding, especially as he has had to confront issues of machismo. It has not been an easy journey, but it has been fruitful as he has opened his heart to his family and reconciled with his father. On the other hand, there are times when we must give lower priority to our culture. 
Consider German Mennonites who emigrated to Canada. In the early 20th century, a significant number of them recognized that their churches were filling up with nominal Christians who used church as a social center, cultivating their cultural roots more than their relationship with God. To avoid spiritual stagnation, these Germans decided to send their children to Prairie Bible Institute and other English-speaking general culture schools. In so doing, they lost the German language for the next generation. Many lost strong convictions about pacifism, which was a value the people had treasured for centuries. But they recovered evangelistic zeal and considered the trade worth the cost. According to historian Frank Epp, who is also from that background, they also gained, for better or worse, the use of English language in preaching, four-part singing, Sunday schools, mission programs, budgets, evangelistic revivals, the use of pianos, cathedral-style churches, personal conversions, private enterprise, independent congregations, and above all, better organization with non-ordained members in church councils and constitutions, curbing the power of bishops. These German Canadians were willing to pay with their ethnicity in order to keep their faith alive in the next generation. Inevitably, when children go back to their home country, they will experience some confusion. There is no way to avoid this completely. Living in two cultures costs the psyche something. This is on a continuum with the experience of colonized people when the language and culture of the colonizers overpowers local language and culture. In Nick Joaquin's portrait of the artist as Filipino, for example, Don Perico is a poet who wrote in Spanish before the Americans arrived. He laments, who now can read my poems? They might as well be written in Babylonian. How many grandparents around the world echo this lament? Culture clashes can cause pain. What can parents do to help their children in times like this? Well, I have a series of strategic suggestions there. Um, the next issue is schooling, which I'm sure uh, all of you have thought about quite a bit. It's a major. But I'd like to go down to social media, because that's a new area. There's been a revolution in global family communication patterns since the development of social media. Consider Donna, a Filipina care home worker in Cambridge, England. Every evening at about 10 p.m. her time, she webcams her husband and two sons, ages 10 and 12, while they're eating breakfast here in the Philippines. She has always loved the breakfast hour, and now through social media, she can still be there. Through the camera, she admires her son's school uniforms and gives them advice on their homework. When that call is finished, Donna webcams her mother, who looks after Donna's eight-month-old daughter. How did baby sleep? What will she eat? Donna sings songs to baby and plays peekaboo with her. The next morning, Donna's first action is to read the texts that her sons have sent. She made them promise that they would text her every day, and she sends them money to do that. Next, she will call her husband and her mother to ask how their day has gone, and maybe webcam them again. Later, during her break from work, she will call her husband yet again, just to say, Kumasta, how are you? Finally, on weekends, when all her relatives gather at her mother's house for a family meal, she will webcam them, her mother, and talk to many of her kin. They, in turn, will leave the camera on for hours, sometimes as long as eight consecutive hours, so that she can be part of their life. Meanwhile, Donna owns her own cafe in the Facebook social networking game, Cafe World. She has made one of her sons her virtual employee, and they interact daily through this online game. How this contrasts with the old days when a lonely mother waited for letters that rarely came. This media involvement is not cheap, but many overseas parents consider it a priority. Children, however, are divided on whether they like this much communication. Approximately 50% of the children surveyed value it greatly, whereas the other 50% found it annoying. <clears throat> the rise of social media presents other challenges for child rearing. Pornography is one issue. 
Another is the temptation to spend too much time on media and not enough time in face-to-face -face relationships. And that, I'm going to skip the question, what we, can we do for family fun? Uh, the Asian couple I quote, there is a, actually a Filipino couple. The mother is a nurse, the dad's an office administrator. They have three early teen children and they say, uh, where can we take our kids during the holidays? We go to the desert and take photos with camels, but there's not the natural or cultural variety we would have back home. The kids ask, why can't we have a normal life, ride bikes, have a backyard? So then there are some suggestions for what to do. Um, the next section is separated children, and it is about uh, children who go home as young adults and the re-entry shock that they go through, or a little bit about children who are left behind with relatives. Uh, and I'm just going down to um, almost to the end of that section. Uh, second paragraph from the end. If we make deep friendships overseas, we can never completely go home again. There will be some pain. That is the price we pay for loving and being loved in more than one place. Some adults who grew up overseas regret that they never were encouraged to mourn their losses when they came home. One said, our parents are proud of our independence and cite how well adjusted we are. But in fact, that very toughness is the only protection a missionary kid can make for the intense pain of separation. Lament is a valid biblical activity. The alternative is numbness when the pain is great. Lament lets us feel authentically. The Japanese have a phrase, mono na aware, about the pain we feel when we see something beautiful because we know we cannot keep the beauty. Spanning cultures is like that. The experience is too big for us. Subtly, it nudges us to long for heaven. And then, uh, finally, in this section, a community of pilgrims. Uh, there is a, a book entitled Dancing in the Dark, Youth, Music, and Popular Culture. Uh, and what this book uh, concludes is that the, uh, it's a Christian book, but it concludes that the, the music that a young person listens to is, is less uh, important. We should be less concerned about that than their intergenerational friendships. Friendships with older adults shape us profoundly. Parents are key, but children also need to know other Christians with different personalities and gifts and perspectives. Amid this variety, young people can glimpse how they too might fit in the church. Similarly, sociologist Christian Smith, in his award-winning book, Soul Searching, emphasizes that adult-child relationships are key to faith formation. Churches should encourage intergenerational projects and activities, and parents should connect their children with godly adults spanning racial, economic, and age lines, and gender too, I suppose. Social media cannot replace ongoing, casual, face-to-face -face talks or hugs. Of course, parents' modeling matters too. Busy and tired, sometimes parents forget. Yet, in Eugene Peterson's book, Growing Up in Christ, a guide for families of adolescents, he writes, the task of the parent is not directly to confront the problems of the young and find the best solutions for them. It is to confront life and Christ in life and deal with that. A parent's main job is not to be a parent, but to be a person. A parent's main job is not to be a parent, but to be a person. Okay, and then the last section. What can the church do? Recommendations for making a difference. And I have um, bounced out nine strategic action points. Uh, some of them are things like you see in five. Uh, uh, an online children's magazine uh, with a lot of links and a lot of activities, and, and maybe in several languages. And then the point before, although I changed it now, it's a bit different, um, 
an online youth magazine that is created by youth themselves, maybe globally, uh, with a couple of adult mentors, uh, but the youth themselves taking ownership, creating magazine. Um, th then you go up to point two, you see pastors preaching notes on marriage and parenting with applications for families who are living overseas. These should be written in local languages, not translations, but original adaptations from general material in Tagalog, in uh, Tamil, in Hindi, and maybe Telugu, in Spanish, in Portuguese, in Korean, in Chinese, in French, uh, and Nuer, uh, with all the South Sudanese, and um, uh, Arabic, with all of the Syrians who, praise God, are turning to Christ uh, in the refugee situation. Pastors preaching notes. And then the next point three, an adult curricular guide for groups to parallel the pastors preaching, uh, which can be used by Bible study groups, mothers groups, general adult groups, and so forth. And that could include guides for family devotions tailored to migrant families in appropriate languages. Now, to uh, undergird this, points one and two, research. Research diaspora families. Uh, and then research re-entry issues. Local Bible school and seminary students should be encouraged to write MA theses in this area. If necessary, the Diaspora Task Force can offer some training and guidance for research. And then if you go down to uh, points six and following, you see a bunch more suggestions. Uh, point nine. Redefinition of the Christian family. Uh, a family is not necessarily two parents and their children living together in one place. Separations fracture hundreds of thousands of families. Churches must adapt their teaching and services to bless these families as much as traditional ones. So, redefinition of the family. Yesterday I read an announcement of a big conference on the Christian family that will take place in Dallas in October and is talking about the family in crisis. Well, if any families are facing crisis, it would be families in the diaspora. And so I think somebody from the diaspora task force needs to go to that conference uh, and other such conferences to raise awareness. What is the Christian family today? Wrapping up, what does it mean to be a global human being? We all need roots. We cannot be citizens of everywhere, but we can be hybrids, deeply connected to more than one place. Such people will be the bridge builders of the future. What movement spans cultures, races, genders, rich and poor, illiterates and PhDs? The Church of Jesus Christ. In this movement, it is not monocultural Christians from cocooned enclaves who will be equipped to leave the natural bridge builders will be liminal, hyphenated, polycentric, multilingual Christians, the hybrid children of today. For them, we pray in the words of Ron Sider, now may the radical justice of God the Father, the liberating forgiveness of God the Son, and the revolutionary transforming presence of God the Holy Spirit, so blow through your lives that you may go forth into this broken world and fight the Lamb's war, knowing that the risen King already has won the victory over injustice, violence, and death. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.